My name is David. I'm a developer advocate for a company called Influx Data. Uh, our primary product is InfluxDB, an open source time series database. Anyone familiar before I begin? Okay, a few hands. All right, first we'll start with me. So I'm Scottish. I have a load of animals in my house. I really like esoteric programming languages. Now this is the question I ask every time and I've not had a hand. So I'm looking for someone here. But has anyone ever heard of or written a line of pony? All right, that's your mission after this talk. Go look up Pony Lang, very, very cool. Um, Rust usually gets a few more hands, still kind of esoteric, but a very cool language too. I am uh, quite into the container ecosystem. I'm a member of the Kubernetes organization, and I've been involved in a release team for the last year. So if anyone wants to talk about Kubernetes or containers at any point, please come and speak to me. And I am a practicing Stoic. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Stoicism, it's just the idea that being uncomfortable with being comfortable with uncomfortable situations, like this. So. And my animals, so I've got a small video. Does anyone know what a chinchilla is? So I have two dagos, five chinchillas, a free Roman ferret, a dog, some fish, and some other stuff. But aren't they just the cutest animals in the world? Anyway. Now it's stuck, there we go. Okay, so the talk, introduction to time series. Before we begin, I'm going to start with a small pop quiz. Right? When we talk about time series, we generally think about monitoring, um, IoT, we talk about uh, financial trading, etc. But there's a whole bunch of fundamental concepts of time series that are actually much, much older. So we're going to play the invented when game, and I'm just going to play with myself. I'm not going to make anyone participate that doesn't want to participate. But as developers or operators or anything like that, we have to deal with the concept of encoding probably on a daily basis, whether that be JSON encoding or other formats. But when do we think encoding was first used in modern civilization? The surprising answer might be that actually it goes back to 410 BC. So not that new. The encoding system back then was documented in Plutarch. Um, it's just ancient Rome kind of, uh, I guess, studies, diary, a mixture of both. And what they said in this book was that there was a mercenary, someone who had a boat with a crew and the ability to fight, called Alcibiades, who didn't fight for any one particular side in any war. What he used to do was show up to the battle, kind of scope out who's who, and then raise a flag to see which one he was going to kill. That was his entire premise. And I'm sure he made a lot of money during that. Now, maybe it's a bit of a stretch to consider this encoding, but he used a very simple flag-based system to indicate to a much greater audience what side of that battle he was going to participate on. Now, we're talking about the 14th century. So think about that. It's 1,500 years at, at, at minimum. And the system hadn't really evolved much in that time. So they're now on a system with one flag or two flags. Right? 1,500 years to decide we could add another flag. Um, but then shortly after that, just another 100 years, things started to get a little bit more sophisticated. They actually had 15 flags to represent different um, letters or, or actions that they were going to partake in, in the war. And then just a couple of hundred years later, in the 17th century, this system is actually still used today by most Navy ships. So we have a system that represents numbers and some letters with flags, and they have different colors, and that's it. Right? So encoding. Not new, very, very old, and has been used across the last 2,000 years. So if I ask you when sharding is, is anyone brave enough to think it's modern? Hopefully not. Sharding is also very old, but when we talk about it in a technology sense, we may think of sharding as this new thing that people didn't use before. But it actually dates back to 150 BC. It wasn't documented until many years later, but the concept of sharding may not be what we think of today. What the Romans did was take the Roman alphabet, split it across five tablets with five letters on each tablet. And the reason they did this is because the way you won any war 2,000 years ago was how fast you could communicate with your troops in different posts, being able to use tactics to your advantage to attack your, you know, your enemy. So I managed to find a 2,000-year-old photo this is how they did the encoding. Um, and they used a flame system or a smoke system. 
So on the left wall, they would have five people, all with the flame torch, and they would indicate which tablet the message was going to come from. If they raised the four smoke flames, they would know a fourth tablet. On the right-hand side, they would do the same to indicate which letter on the tablet. And they were able to transmit messages really, really far and really, really fast. And that was the biggest advantage that the Roman Empire had when it came to fighting their enemies. If, like me, you appreciate learning about these kind of historical points and, and how technology maybe isn't as new as we like to believe, there's a really good book called The Early History of Data Networks. Most of the examples I spoke about here are in this, and there are so much more. So if you enjoyed that, buy this book, read it, you'll have a great time. Okay, now the time series, that has to be new, right? Can't be old, time series must be new. Unfortunately, the time series is also really old. The Romans had a concept of time series. In fact, the Romans used to have IPOs. The Romans used to have stock markets. The Romans used to trade shares and companies with their peers. People were tracking the price and profitability and value of all of these companies, going to the Roman markets and trading the shares in all of their companies, making some extra money. And I find that fascinating, right? Nothing we do is new. The Romans did everything 2,000 years ago, but we can learn a lot of lessons from them. So again, many, many, many years later, the Netherlands were the first to have the first IPO that we have on record. That was in 1602. The US were lagging behind, of course. Um, they had their first IPO then. Now, I think what's important here about these two events is that the concept of time series as a phrase has never been used in any public writing ever at this point. In fact, it was in 1884 that someone actually coined the term time series. And what they were interested in was if we import silk and cotton and other uh, textiles from around the world, does that have any correlation with the export price that we are getting on our wheat? And the answer was yes. Um, I would not suggest reading that article. Um, it hasn't aged well, it's very dry, but you know, it's there, it's available. But as a, as a term, time series isn't that old, 1884. Okay? So that's a date that none of us were alive, but not too long ago. Why is this important? Well, it was the first paper that ever actually used the dimension of time in any statistical mathematics or analysis of numbers. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so my CTO hates it when I put this slide in, but on my first week of the job, um, I spoke with him, and he told me that most data is best understood on a dimension of time, and that has stuck with me for the last 15 months. And it really opens your eyes when you think about that, and especially when you go back to your jobs on Monday and you're starting to look at the amount of data that you have. Start to think about the dimension of time and how that applies to your data, and the whole world of possibilities are going to open up. So now we're actually going to start the talk. That's the history bit done. What are we going to cover? We're going to talk about what time series data is. I am going to talk to you a little bit about TSDBs and why you should use a time series database instead of a general purpose database. I will use some examples with InfluxDB because that's who pays me and that's the product that I'm most familiar with. What I will tell you is that everything I cover is very much agnostic and will work with Prometheus or any other TSDB that you may be using. I will talk a little bit about the value and not just the value but the cost of time series data. There's a lot to understand and um, mostly because generally you have a lot of time series data and you have to understand the trade-off of storing it all or storing some. And then I'll talk a little bit about, as developers and operators, where we've moved in the last 10 years and why time series data is so important to understand that migration from monolithic to cloud native to microservices and serverless. Okay, so what is time series data? Nice and simple, any piece of data with a timestamp is time series data. That's it, there's nothing fancy here. If you have something in a file or written to a database that has some sort of created that, last updated that, <laughs> any of that, that is considered time series data. So I'm going to kind of walk you through an example to understand why we need the dimension of time when we talk about data. And what I have here is just random scenarios that everyone here should hopefully be familiar with inside of our infrastructure. So in the light red color, we have the memory hitting 100%. That would be a cause for concern. Right? If we see the memory usage at 100%, something may be wrong. 
Next, we have a health check failing. If there is a health check failing in our, our production infrastructure, something is wrong. And of course, if we see a pod killed by the memory, um, that is a bad thing. We don't want pods to be dying or processes, whatever you want to think of there. And then in the orangey yellow color, what we have are potential causal events. These are not dangerous on their own, but they could be a trigger for the dangerous stuff. So if we have a database migration that runs, that could cause problems, it could break our application. If a pod gets restarted in Kubernetes, that could lead to potential problems too. If we deploy a new version of our app, I've spoken to developers, we are likely to introduce bugs. New versions equal new problems. If our CI passed and started, may not necessarily be a causal event, but could trigger something else in our infrastructure. In the purple, we have things that should have absolutely no correlation whatsoever to any of the dangerous stuff in our infrastructure. So if you do a git commit or the CPU is hovering around the 12% mark, that should not give you any cause for concern. And the red herring in pink, Scotland qualifying for the World Cup, I've lost all hope of that ever happening. <laughs> now it's really difficult from here to understand what happened in the system. But when we apply the dimension of time, things actually begin to make sense. What we see here is the memory hit 100%. That process was killed by the ARM. We triggered a new deployment because of that. Now, if you're in container land, that could be using the latest tag. Right? Very dangerous. You're always going to pull stuff that you don't necessarily know what's running in production. When that happened, it caused the database migration to run, which broke all of our tables because we weren't supposed to release it yet. Our health check is now failing. And now our application is in some sort of crash loop back off state. So understanding what happened, when it happened, and the order that it happened is how we make sense of complex situations. Everyone familiar with this screen? Right. No matter what you use for storing logs, logs are classical time series data. What is the first thing we put at the beginning of every log line? A timestamp. Right. These are events. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about structure and events, but if you're not writing your event, your log data in JSON that can be parsable by a TSDB or other system, you're losing out on a lot of intrinsic value. And there'll be some examples of that later, but if you want to talk about structured log, and just come and find me after this talk. So what is time series data? Well, we know there's anything with a timestamp, but there are actually two classifications of time series data as well. So what we have first is regular time series data, and I'm going to try and refer to this as metrics for the rest of this talk. What makes it a metric is that it is predictably available. So regular time series should always be available in the same interval. Examples of that would be the CPU usage and so forth. A regular time series is not predictable. I cannot tell you when that next event will happen. And we're going to call that events. It's unpredictable and inconsistent. So an example of regular metrics or regular time series of metrics, CPU usage, memory usage, so we're talking about Linux system infrastructure monitoring here. We could be tracking the ping time or latency to some sort of external service, and we do that every 10 seconds. That is predictable. And if we want to track the number of processes running on any machine, again, if we request that value every 10 seconds, it will always be available. Irregular time series are things that we cannot predict. Can you tell me when the next login event will happen in your system? Right. No. You do not know when the next user is going to get their password incorrect, nor when the CI is going to finish, or if someone is going to trip over a network cable in your data center and take down a few systems. But these are things that are all valuably important and should be stored somewhere, but you can never predict it. And the way that we handle these two different types of series, uh, time series data has to, has to um, be different. OK, so we have a football game. There is time series data everywhere. And for a start, there's time series data in this room. As a metric, at any interval, I can ask how many people are in this room, and I will get a number from zero to whatever. So in a football game, we have the exact same. Now, there are a few different types of uh, time series data here. First, we have the number of people in the stadium. So that would be a metric and regular. We also have goals scored. So they have a timestamp. We know that at 54 minutes and seven minutes in this game, there was a goal scored. We know who did it. That is an event, and it's irregular. We cannot predict when the next goal will come. If we could, we would all be a lot richer. We also have aggregate, and that's really important in time series data as well. 
So we are actually able to calculate an aggregate score over multiple games. Um, we're not going to talk about aggregates too much today, but they're a special form of metric. And in fact, there is um, some more event-based data here. If we take the number of people in the audience, that is an aggregation of a set of events. How many people came into the stadium, how many people left the stadium. If you track every one person in and one person out, you have a, an aggregate or a metric. So you have to understand the difference between metrics and events. Uh, and what's important is that all metrics are aggregations. Everything. Even the CPU load on your machine is an aggregation. We just don't find a lot of value in storing every CPU instruction sent, every instruction sent to the CPU. It would be very costly, because it would be billions and billions, but all metrics are aggregations. So how do we collect time series data? I'm gonna talk about a couple of ways, um, just from the InfluxDB and infrastructure monitoring point of view. Of course, you can have client libraries for PHP to write to your TSDB of choice, but a lot of this work has already been done and is already available to you to be consumed. So there is a project from Influx Data called Telegraph. It has a whole bunch of inputs and outputs. The reason I'm listing the outputs is that we are a very open company. We don't really care or mind if you want to use Telegraph to write to another TSDB. We don't lock you into InfluxDB. We support inputs like CloudWatch, Elasticsearch, Kafka, Jenkins, Kubernetes, anything you have running in your infrastructure is emitting time series data. And the tooling to collect that is there in a couple of lines of TOML. So you don't even need to write anything complicated to start a store in this time series. If you come from a Prometheus uh, background, then there's a whole bunch of exporters that are very similar to the Telegraph plugins as well. Basically, no matter what you run in your infrastructure, there's something there to collect that data. So you should begin to leverage it. And anyone who has already been doing a little bit of time series research, there is a bit of a dogmatic war. Should I pull or should I push my time series data? You know, Prometheus goes down the essence of you should always pull. InfluxDB actually supports both. And the reason for that is you really do need to support both. Right? For metrics, yes, you can pull that on a regular predictable interval. The value will always be there, and you're going to have a really good time. You're going to collect loads of data and learn loads of insights. For the, unpre for the events and unpredictable interval stuff, you cannot pull it. You don't know when it's going to happen. For that, we do need a push approach. So you're going to have to instrument your code to push those events to a TSDB. So there's not one right way. You have to kind of adopt both. Use cases for time series data. As developers, you may be very familiar with monitoring your application. Of course, the Linux machines that run on, any cloud VMs, and so forth. IoT, massive amount of time series data there. You know, if you have a digital thermostat in your house, it's constantly checking the temperature and emitting that. It's constantly tweaking the water pressure and the boiler, et cetera. And of course, real-time analytics. If you have a website that's on online and people browse to it, you maybe want to track them. When they go there, how long they stay there, when they leave, where they go to, where they came from, all time series data. So time series data literally is everywhere in our stack already, uh, and you just have to identify it. Now the database bit. So why should I use a TSDB over any other system? Well, the way that time series database stores data is in a very particular format, right? The way that we read the data is very, very unique as well. Time series data is not small data. Generally, we're talking millions to billions of points on a regular frequency. That means that we have to have high velocity writes. Our reads are very different and unique, right? You would never go to a TSDB and say, give me every value for this series across all time. That would be really painful. Generally, 99% of the time, you're going to go, I want all the values for this series within a specific window. So the way the sharding has to happen, the way the indexes are built, is all built around time. And because there's a very heavy cost to storing time series data, just because of the pure volume and size, we have to have time to live or some sort of life cycle management for that data to either expire it, round it up, or downsample it, and so forth. And we will talk about that in a minute. So this graph comes from dbengines.com, and they track a whole wealth of statistics about uh, Twitter mentions, Google searches, active repositories on GitHub, all this other data. And they try to track the growth curves of each individual database, but also databases as a category. The blue line that's storming away at the top here is time series. 
It's the fastest growing category of database for the last two years, maybe a little bit longer. And I think the reason this is the fastest growing database is we're, we're now starting to change our architectures. I won't make you show your hands, but there are going to be a number of people in this room who have a monolithic application that are talking about containerization, microservices, and cloud native. And what we do when we make that architectural switch is that we move a lot of complexity that we used to keep in our code to the infrastructure layer. And it's that complications in the infrastructure layer that have led people to make their uh, monitoring a lot more advanced. So the new stack did a study, and they asked people, or developers, you know, do you have time series data? And if you do, do you store it in a time series database? 12% said yes. But 88% of the people that had time series data were using a general purpose database instead of a time series database. Now, I think that's mildly confusing. Um, and I don't think it's entirely accurate. And what I want to show you, besides just using a really cool Rick and Morty image, is that you probably already are using a time series data and just weren't aware. So if your company has too much money, you may be using New Relic. If you have light, a little bit less money, you may be using Datadog. And probably everyone is using Google Analytics. These are all time series databases, just with a different UI, showing you different stuff and metrics and measures about your applications or your websites. <coughs> Excuse me. So you probably already are using a TSDB. So I think that, that's, that study was just a little bit flawed. Next question. Who's using Kubernetes? Okay, only a few hands. I sent a, a, a poll on Twitter. I think it was around uh, March last year. And I said, I run Kubernetes in production, and I monitor it with. Now, 74% of the people that responded said they were using Prometheus. Right? And that's great. At least they have some sort of metrics and monitoring in place. And because Prometheus is a CNCF project, that number is always going to be higher than any other TSDB. We had 10% using some sort of SaaS, like New Relic or Databog. We had 3% using InfluxDB. And then 13% they're using nothing. Now, I don't know what your level of knowledge of Kubernetes is, but I did say production, and 13% of those people are not monitoring it. And it's a big, scary system. So if you are in that 13%, right, what you learn today, hopefully you can take it away, run InfluxDB or Prometheus or whatever, and begin to monitor that. All right, so it's not too late. This is where we start talking about time series with InfluxDB as a few examples. Remember, it's agnostic. You don't need to use InfluxDB. Um, but it's just the one I'm more comfortable with. Okay, so InfluxDB is a time series database. What's really cool about the company I work for, Influx Data, is everything is open source. And we have a very, very small um, enterprise code base uh, just to make money, to keep us ticking over. But we are a full stack time series company. Uh, what that means is we have Telegraph for collecting your metrics. We give you Chronograph for visualizing that for dashboarding and other tools. You can use Grafana if you're already comfortable with that. It works right out of the box. We also provide Capacitor, which allows you to do real-time streaming and anomaly detection on top of your time series data. We are currently in a process of working on V2 of InfluxDB. It's on beta 4 as of last week, and we'll be hitting GA within the next three months. Um, and FluxDB2 is, is built around containerization and Kubernetes and all the other cool stuff. So if you are doing that migration, you might get a lot of value from playing with that. That's the sales pitch bit then. When we talk about time series data, we talk about points. The best way to think about that is that at some point in time, this equaled this. Now, if we use an example, hopefully we're all relatively familiar with Linux, but it has this concept of load averages. I have a small series key on the left here. <coughs> Excuse me. The series key is made up of a measurement name. So here it's called load. We then have a couple of tag values. So we're saying the host that this load was collected from is called VM1. In the blue, we have the fields. So that's just the one minute, the five minute, and the 15 minute load average. And then in the yellow, we have the timestamp on the end, because all time series data needs a timestamp. A couple of examples here. We could have a stock tickers, so the measurement name is stock price in yellow. The series key is the market and the ticker. So the market, we need to know which market the data came from, and the ticker is the company we're tracking, and there would be some value on the end. 
And of course, you can use that format for anything within your infrastructure. So if you are microservice based, you could just track users, which service they're hitting with their API calls and so forth. Just to cement this, when we talk about a series, what we're saying is that the tag set is the same. So even though the market is NASDAQ on both of these, these are different series because the ticker is different. So if I wanted to pull out all of Google's pricing for the last 24 hours, that would be a series of points in a series. Now, why don't you need to understand the difference between tags and fields? Well, tags are always indexed, which means they can only ever be strings. That just means that when I want to pull out one very specific series from the TSDB, it's really, really fast. But we do want to store multiple types of data across that series, so you can use fields which are not indexed, but they do support multiple data types. So they can also be strings, they could be integers, they could be booleans, and so forth. But they are not indexed, uh, and doing aggregations across them can be really slow. So generally, you would always work with a series, and you would filter by tag. So let's talk about this value and cost about time series data. And in order to understand how costly time series data is, we have to understand one of the most important concepts in inside of time series, and that is resolution. So when I spoke about metrics earlier, I, I spoke about predictable intervals. We call that the resolution of the data. So if I'm going to collect a load average every 10 seconds, that is a 10 second resolution. If I collect a load average if over 30 seconds or one minute, that would be a 30 second or one minute resolution. And the more sophisticated we get with that resolution is going to determine how expensive it is to store that data. So the value of time series data is they're actually correlated with the resolution and how many points of data we have. You can actually use a formula and say 10 second resolution across 10 metrics, multiply them together, and I have some sort of storage requirements of how many points I want to store, and you can calculate that. But it's more important to understand this through an example, I feel. So let's assume we're doing Linux infrastructure monitoring. I'm going to keep this really, really simple to start with. And we're only going to track one value. So if I have one machine, one series, I have one value, that's the CPU, at one second resolution, that means I'm going to store 86,400 points per day inside of my database. Now in order for this example to really strike home with you, what I would suggest is think about storing this number of rows in a general purpose database as the number increases. If we have two machines in our infrastructure, still one single measurement, at one second resolution, we have 172,800 points per day. A modest production infrastructure may have 10 machines, which is 10 series, and you're going to want to track more than the CPU. CPU, memory, disk I.O., a couple other fields, so we're going to have five measurements. We're still going to track it at one, sec one second resolution, and all of a sudden, we're jumping up to 4 million points per day. Again, think about this in the concept of a general purpose database. Are you comfortable storing 4 million points a day? Depends on the database, but maybe not. Now let's jump to a real example of time series data. We have financial trading. On the NASDAQ, there are 3,300 companies. Let's just assume we're only tracking the cost of the ticker. And because it's financial trading, we may have sub-second resolution. Here, we're going to use one millisecond. Realistically, when I speak to financial companies, they are using nanosecond resolution on the trading data. So I just couldn't fit that number on the screen. <laughs> but it's a really big number per day, right? Very, very, very difficult for anyone to store that amount of data in a single database. But time series databases are built to do this, and they will handle it much better. So what happens if we take the one millisecond resolution and drop it to one minute? Well, we're back down to the millions, which is good. What if we drop it to an hour? Then we're in 79,000 points. Right? We're now in the comfortable territory, regardless of what database we use. We are feeling a little bit more comfortable about storing that on a daily basis. And if we jump to a six hour resolution, we're at 13,000 points. You could store that in a JSON file on the disk and load it every time, and you would still be happy with that. So at six hour resolution, we're very, very comfortable now. This is good. Here's my wonderful draft. 
I drew this myself, it's not my kid. Um, but what's important to understand here? We have the dimension of time, and we have the value of the data. And what happens is, if I have one millisecond, or in fact, I have 10 seconds resolution, that data is valuable till a certain point. And then that level of granularity or resolution no longer is that important to me anymore. You know, once my time series data is, what, a day or a week old, do I really need that level of resolution? No. For real-time observability or debuggability, definitely. So then we can maybe move it, and we go to one hour resolution. So the purple line is the, the resolution being changed. The green one is just your value without ever changing the resolution. After an hour, we're still getting more value. And what we really want to achieve is this top purple line. We do want to change the resolution, and we want to maintain as much value as possible for the longer we store the data. When it's not important to us anymore, we have to downsample it or delete it. And that's what it's called. In time series data, you have to downsample. You may find some systems talk about rolling up the data, calculating averages. It's all the same thing. So downsampling data with time series is one of the most important things that you can do, especially as you move from the thousands to the millions of points. InfluxDB makes this really, really easy. This is called a continuous query. It runs on a regular interval. It pulls out data from a predictable window, calculates the average, and then stores it in a different um, retention policy for longer. So what most people using InfluxDB do is collect data at high resolution, say one second, and they'll keep that for one day. Anything older than a day, they calculate the average for the day and store it for a week or a month. Anything older than a month, they calculate the average for a week and store that for a year. So you have that nice value curve going down slowly and you're reducing the points, the same as we did with the NASDAQ. You know, we went from the 200 billion points per day to 18,000. And it's as simple as a five line continuous query like that. So it's really important. It's the one thing that I always say to people, if you leave this talk with nothing but this, that's good. Right? Roll-ups, downsampling, really, really important. Unfortunately, for events in a regular time series, you cannot calculate the average. Right? There's no predictability there. The average would tell us nothing. So there's an entire wealth of information on doing um, anomaly and outlier detection. You can Google for that with InfluxDB. There are plenty of docs. I definitely do not have time to go into this today, but there are approaches to do it. So if you want to store your logs inside of InfluxDB, you can. And there's a really good way to sample that over time. OK, so now that we have all of this time series data, what does that mean for the monitoring of our applications and our infrastructure? What can we do with it? Let's talk about the most simplest architecture in the world. We have one application that speaks to one database. Right, this is the monolithic architecture. If we want to monitor this system, and I'm only going to speak from my own experience here. I'm not saying this is necessarily what everyone does. But in the early 2000s, what we would do is set up check-based monitoring. Check-based monitoring says, if the CPU ever goes above 80%, I'm going to reboot the machine. If the memory usage ever goes above 80%, I'm going to reboot the machine. If the response time of my application hits above 300 milliseconds, I'm going to reboot the machine. Black Friday, I used to work on e-commerce stores, we would go out, we would buy a whole bunch of new machines, we'd stick them in our racks, and then we'd sell them two weeks later. Right? That's how we handled scale back in those days. <laughs> this was just really simple. Right? When you have one application speaking to one database, life is easy, kind of. So in this system, when do we send a message to our DevOps, our SRE, our operations people? And generally, we just have a health check on our application. And if that begins to fail, we page someone, and they have to go look at the logs and work out why that's failing. Again, things were a lot simpler in the early 2000s. And if you're lucky enough to still be on this architecture today, I'm very envious. But then, of course, we started to do horizontal scaling. We'd have more than one application still speaking to one database. And it got a little bit trickier. How do we send a page when we're doing horizontal scalability? Does a health check failing on one of our nodes mean we should page someone? No. What we actually used to do was just kind of work out how many 500s we had, and if it was a certain quantile, 
eventually we would pitch someone and they would have to go and look and see what was wrong. So things were still okay at this point. Fast forward to the modern day, and this is generally what we're working with. So we have microservices now. We have independently scalable services. Service B has two instances here. We've got service one. Service C has a canary deployment because we want to do traffic shaping and send 10% of our traffic to one individual uh, new version. Of course, all our networks are virtualized now, whether we're in the cloud or using Kubernetes CNIs. Everything goes through some sort of software-defined networking there. Each microservice generally speaks to its own database, and those databases vary in different types. And of course, we've got the service mesh because everybody really needs a service mesh now, so we're proxying all of our traffic through that as well. How do we even begin to understand if this system is healthy? So there is a cloud-native convenience versus cost argument. I guess it's really difficult when you make this migration to microservices to continue doing check-based monitoring. In fact, you can't. There is no way to tell if a system is healthy using check-based monitoring. And I'm talking about systems like Nagios and the Singa, right? We have to start using TSDBs. That's why the DB engine's graph is going up at the fastest growing rate, because many, many companies and teams are adopting this. So we can no longer treat the symptoms. We really need to understand the system as a whole and determine how to fix it. So we have to upgrade our monitoring. And what we're talking about is causality. How can I find the root cause and fix it? And not just that, but how can I do that quickly and efficiently without major impact to my users or customers? And if I had an answer for that, that would be great, wouldn't it? So when we use a time series database, we have access to weeks, months, or years of data at different resolution. So we can leverage that for statistic modeling to understand our systems. We have tags that are indexed on all of our time series data. Not only do we understand the type of user we have, what services they're heading, what region they're coming from, all of this is tag-based data that can be applied to the time series or the events. And we have a wealth of statistical methods available to us in Prometheus and Influx and Datadog and New Relic. Now that's just a list of six. There are dozens of statistical methods. You do not need to know how they work. And you just call the function, you pass in some data, and it's going to give you some sort of distribution or graph or chart that allows you to understand your system. So I've got a couple of examples. In a previous life, I was an SRE. I wasn't a good one, but I was an SRE. And my biggest complaint about that job was being paged at 4 a.m. with a disk alert. Hopefully a few people have had this. You get woken up at 4 a.m. because the disk is just across 90% capacity. Now, because I was a terrible SRE, I would fumble through to my office, get my laptop, SSH into the machine, and type RM minus RF, and delete as much as humanly possible from that machine so that I could go back to bed. That meant I deleted var temp. It meant I deleted var cache. It meant I deleted var log, because I'm never going to need to log data anymore. But it worked. My machine would be back to 30% disk utilization. I go back to bed, mental note, I'll fix that tomorrow. I never fixed it tomorrow. And that just repeated. This happened a lot. Now what if we had this as time series data? What if I wasn't doing check-based monitoring? Well, I could actually track the growth on that disk over time, which means I can use linear prediction algorithms that are all provided in every TSDB to predict ahead of time hopefully at 1 or 2 p.m. in the afternoon when I've got my good brain on, and say, there's a really highly probable chance this disk is going to fill up at 4 a.m. I'm going to page you now. And that's what we need. This is the value in time series data. Using that monitoring of growth or regression, tracking it over time, and sending alerts to actually improve your infrastructure and your job. And of course, if we use loads of tags that show which process is writing to the disk at what speeds, we can actually track down the problem domain, the problem process, the problem application, and work out why it's producing so many logs. The next thing I want to talk about is, as we adopt microservices, how do we understand if our users are having a happy time on our website? And histograms are really, really important. The problem with histograms is there are two different variations. Now, 
Some of you may be very familiar with this. And this is how we instrument our code at present, using tools like Prometheus and Datadog and a few other things. We define these buckets in our applications. So the request comes in. We say, oh, we're about to respond to this. The time since the request came in was 311 milliseconds. We stick it into a bucket in our application and send that to our TSDB. The problem with this approach is we're pre-aggregating that event-based data. Is my application always going to respond in one of those buckets? Are there any scenarios where that can change? How do I make that dynamic? If you want to change this, you have to deploy. And then you lose all previous data. Well, at least your previous data will have the old buckets. Your application has had massive speed improvements. And now everything is in the first bucket. There's no value there. There's no distribution. So we cannot use histograms in an effective method of modern architectures with pre-aggregated buckets. So that's your warning. What we really want to be able to do is do the histogramic query time, passing in a time series of data using dynamic buckets that understand we're looking at 24 hours of data, calculate some means, do, uh, do query time bucketing. But not only that, we then want to forward all of that data to something called mode. What does mode allow us to do? Well, it allows us to generate distributions from highly available tag sets within that data. So if we talk about that in a more practical example, if we have a percentage of our users that are experienced in one second response times, that's bad. If we grab that data, zoom into it, pick out that bucket, pass it through to mode, it's going to analyze all of the tag sets for that data and tell us which tags are most frequently used. And it may be that for our premium customers, we inject an extra set of scripts or JavaScript that does some sort of extra tracking, which is delaying some sort of response or load time on the client side of the browser. And just by using the modality function, we can identify that really, really quickly and at query time. And finally, because I have a bit of an e-commerce background, one of the toughest things we had was understanding how many servers we were going to need to handle events like Black Friday or Christmas and so forth. And it's still a really difficult problem. I also used to work for a media company that did rock and metal news. And the biggest rock and metal news in the last 20 years was probably the death of Lemmy. And we could not scale to that. But fortunately, well, no, not unfortunately, if we were using a time series database, we could have ran scenarios through something called Holt Winters, predicting major events and trying to have it take in a, a series of data from like, and like events and applying some sort of scale to it to work out how many servers or machines or VMs I would need to handle certain failure scenarios. So Holt Welters is, again, available on most TSDBs. You just pass in data and look for cyclic data or, or things that repeat. Very, very handy and very, very convenient. And the whole point of this is that once we have time series data, it allows us to build our automation, determine root cause analysis using historical data, and that's just the, the, the start, right? We can then start to do prediction and machine learning on that stream of data as well. There are a wealth of tools that hook into InfluxDB, Prometheus, through Kafka, that run uh, machine learning models on your time series data to do uh, security threat detection, anomalies, and so forth. Very, very cool. So in summary, please use a TSDB. Do not use a general purpose database for your time series data. Please roll up and downsample your data as much as possible. Right? It's very expensive to score billions, very expensive to store billions of points. So you have to understand how long it's available to you and plan your downsampling appropriately. You can run outlier and event-based detection, uh, run outlier and anomaly detection on your events, and really just build as much tooling, dashboarding, and automation as possible with this data. There's no point in storing it for it there not to be consumed and used to your advantage. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. And I hope you're interested in time series data, but a little bit. <laughs>